I lived once on the ocean floor, all robot help and sliding doors, and thought seldom of the shore. Until I received one night a letter from my grandfather, and the letter read, Dear Empty Head, ye who dwell on ocean's bed, I send this by the cracked moon's light, it likely be the last I write. I'll take soon flight for a long journey's while to the ninth isle. Remember me as I will you, all tree houses and untied shoe. In hope someday we meet again, your distant kin, Sebastian. But a farewell by letter is little better than no farewell at all. So on a young man's whim for my grandfather, I set off in search of him. I left by quiet my stately keep, the escape was easy, guards asleep, and wandered bout on tiptoe feet, the tall glass halls and cold steel streets, and found at last an airlock. But for love or none could find no life suit or aqualung, so deep breath then, I go to find Sebastian. Then airlock open and off into the freezing hug of the dark ocean. And struggling up, heart kicking like a drum then, limbs and lungs all done then. And the next thing I knew, I awoke again, all gasping and flail, and wet as whales, and most pinned by wind and water, a storm, yea, a storm. Hell's teeth, an eye at the center, an eye swimming as though possessed, an eye to die and senses arrested, and kicked my legs in fit of fear, and knew no north from south, or my mouth from my ass as I rolled about in the water. But God, air, and true wind on my face, for I had not known such a thing in all my remembering. And though I might well drown and sink true down to the ocean floor once more in but a minute's stem, for this moment swirling in those salt eddies, I was a boy again. And stormy though the night was hung, beyond that storm I knew the sun. Nay, but I was still of fate's behest, and had no interest in the valley of death, and by width and breadth did trial about a long while, and the water did carry me along and put my soul and breath asunder. So this is how it ends, the long going under, and with water in my mouth, good night. Yes, give up air and everywhere, yes, good night. I go to seek a water sleep. But fate was hard at play, and I woke again, this time day, the storm a year away, so far as the sky told that story. A beach, whereupon the sea had spat me out like some dislikable pip, and I alive and washed ashore with bones and balls all sore, and what's more, there in the sky's moor was the moon in cracked spoils of dead rock, as though God himself had struck it with his mighty galactic com- But nay, there a man approached along the sand and called to see if I was alright and his face became familiar of a sudden. Grandfather, I said. Uh, no, replied he with concerned eyes on me and continued, Sir, whatever ordeal you've just been through has perhaps relieved the sense from you. May I ask your name? And though I did my best not to show it, my name, I realized, I did not know it. And my companion helped me to my feet, led me down the beach, and I walked bent double, still reeling from the morning's trouble. Then, said he, checking my memory, and how old is your grandfather? Said I, I don't recall at all. Perhaps you're right, I'm rattled slight from the ocean. Okay, he said, then which island is it you're from? I'm not from an island, I said. I hail from beneath the sea in that great aquatic nursery, for I am but 21 years old, and from youth's throes I escaped the watery below for one last hour with the man who taught me all I know. And slow, he said, but you are too young, you shouldn't be above the water. Not until their 100th year can nursery folk yet come up here. I only avoided his chiding stare, and took great gulps of salt sea air. Finally, he said, I think it best we find this grandfather of yours, and get you to safe keeping. No isle is distant, mind, and I have a vehicle of my own design. Come along, we'll make it wherever, together. And he led me to some great balloon, whereupon we got in, and though he touched no gauge or board, the craft set off of its own accord. We were out over the water then and I saw the stories were true. So these lands were an archipelago, many islands scattered higgledy here and there, and I shouted to the man, are they a totality? Nay, said he, each is its own little principality, and just like your nursery, one lives on the isle fitting of their age, as you would too if the rules you actually obeyed. And pointing then, he shouted, there that land of birch and oak does house those juvenile century folk, and there that land with beach and pier suits those in their 200th year. The three hundreders are to the west, the fourth prefer the forest best, and so on. I shan't recount them all. We've not far to go, and our time is small. Sir, I said, with all these folk living so high on time's shelf, I wonder if I might ask you how old you are yourself. 
And he replied, Let's say if there be a tree that needs watering once a century, then I have filled my watering can eight times so far. I could not help but stare at this man who, ignoring his demeanor, appeared physically only five years my senior and in perfect health, but had somehow eventually aged eight centuries. And before I could comment, there appeared upon the horizon, rising up skywards, some needle wound at least 10,000 feet above ground. Vishnu's ass! I cried. What is that? A tower whereby, he did reply, it kisses tongues the edge of sky, and if you were to reach its spire, you'd see the breadth of space entire. It proves most convenient for ascending objects into orbit without need of fuel or speed. And though keep your eyes open yet, he mumbled slight, and five seconds hence did see him right, for overhead and yonder yet were craft wide as twenty jumbo jets, seemingly sitting there in the air by dare of whim. Oh gods, you're all so clever, I cried. You built all of this? Aye, he said. Year to year ascended each by hammer's knack and numbers reach. And quite a while we watched the scene, his face sincere, then turned to me and said, young man, be honest. What is it you want with your grandfather, really? Are you so bold you can't just let the old be old? Nay, I said. I wish to talk with he who by longevities, like you, has endured the centuries. Besides, he says he's going elsewhere, and I'd like to follow him there. His letter said the Isle of Nines. If that's his ground, that's where I'm bound. Actually, I wonder if I ask, dare, you'd get me there. He was quiet a while, pokered face, no smiles, and said, So you think age leads to becoming some great sage, do you? Yes, I'll get you to your grandfather, but we'll take the scenic route on our way to the Isle of the Nines. Fine, said I. Our bearing changed then, southwards bound, for some small spit of sandy ground. I think, said he, we'll search about and see if we can't out some of that wisdom you crave. And before I could protest, we'd set down and come ashore, and were bounding over pier floor, and up then sand and jungle thick, and cut our way with will and stick, and emerged before a town. In the suburbs, folk were felling trees and hauling shore great carts of iron ore. Then further in were folk who looked as young as I, and dancing neath the broke moon sky, all necking bottles, gin and beer, then coupling up to disappear. Which isle is this? I asked my friend. I'm barely two decades old. They act younger yet. The Isle of Ones, said he. All here have aged at least one century. He led me down the winding paths of open debauchery and open bars, and folk who clear appeared they slept perhaps three days a year, and we came upon a woman there, all dancing legs and wild blonde hair. My friend proclaimed, O Lady Mare, I've brought for thee one cub straight from the nursery, and he has questions for his elders. She regarded me with red eyes and regard tireder yet, and said, Nursery, huh? Why, here we've ditched the milk but kept the bottle. Ask away, young Aristotle. And the music did stop. Stop. And all folk turned about with their drunk Blair stares poking out, and the Lady Mayor of the Isle of Ones did close her eyes in great profund. I murmured, why, I am young and confused about everything and sure of nothing, but above all, I should like to know, how does one live well? And how does one see far? And how does one want for nothing and still acquire everything? I leant sure close and cupped my ear, the wisdom of one in her one hundred years, whereby she replied, the secret to acquiring everything? Buy it. How to see far? Squint. And how to live well? Well. I'd suggest you found your answer here. For we've loads of drugs and high strength beer! And though I cried out for clarification, it was surely the end of that conversation. And my new companion led me back past trees and lagoon to our waiting bright balloon. What, I said with confusion fat, the holy fucking shit was that? And off we lifted over the beach, up once again into the wind's reach. Look, he said, true, they're all one century. But since we live at least nine in these enlightened times, they are but teenagers still. Aging is a relative thing. It wasn't long after life extension was perfected, we noticed that the older one dares to grow, the more they prefer the company of those in years close to theirs they know. That is why each age lives on its own isle. You would have little of importance to say to a child, such is the gap ten times wider with us. So there it is. I said, so there it is. Why, my grandfather liked that phrase also. That may be, said he, and yet your grandfather is not me. And following his dead-end boon, I set eyes upon the fractured moon. I said, our pale lady of the night is not looking quite right. What happened to her? The fall, he called. Why, the world wasn't always such a peaceable place. We once used to play war to keep score. How does one blow up a moon? By being smart enough to build technology that can do so, and simultaneously stupid enough to use it. 
Not too long from now, pieces of her will fall to the ground. And if any of us are still around by then, the air will turn deathly, and for sure no living thing will endure. Save for those living beneath the sea. Like me, I said. And what will everyone still above the sea do instead? He said, we've another destination in mind, where we might start over sensibly this time. With a squint, I caught sight, just slight, of rising constructs in the far. Spires and towers for a crown, sure the mark of a city or town. Said I, start over where? Over there? Said he, nay, that is but the remains of nations. Why, sometimes on a new morning, one can still make out the old world. Said I, well, who lives there? No one, he said, or the remains of the dead. The legacy of our forefathers who'd rather blow up a moon than two teams agree on some tune they might both peaceably dance to. To hell with them. For all our modern wonders, it's taken a millennia to recover from their blunders. And from the smallest of corners of my mind's eye, I saw and heard the bright sounds of those dead towns. The blaring horns and thousand forms of life to those days prior to whatever fire they cast on themselves. Back before science had learned to stand in defiance of aging and death. And almost under his breath, my old companion said, The cruel irony is that many folk from that barbaric time still survive today, since aging technology went their way. Yet the human brain can only contain so many memories, and so as they've aged, they've forgotten the truth of what they did to our planet and moon in their youth. And though the catastrophes live on in their name, they have, by quirk of dementia, escaped the blame. What luck, what shame. I said, but you assume from the ruins that they knew what they were doing. Maybe they meant well with their inventions, and broke the world in spite of their best intentions. Right, he said. I'm sure in their empty heads, when they poisoned the ocean and took their wars to the moon, they were really doing it for love and big bright red balloons. And he looked off from our basket a moment and said, Sorry. Said I, don't apologize. Why, all that anger in your eyes makes me just then remember my grandfather's temper. You so resemble him, see. That may be, said he, and yet your grandfather is not me. And I glanced ahead to find we were coming down again, not in a forest this time, but a town of some kind. Stark marble pillars and great mansions and villas. And when we sat down, a man came around and said, Welcome friends, why please enjoy your stay. If you're going to park on the beach, by the way, that'll be 20,000 shells. Oh, add it to my tab, my companion said. And with my confusion stark, we pushed on into a park. At the base of each tree, a sign declared a fee of 10,000 shells for sitting in its shade. Likewise, looking at the birds would cost a third of what one in a month made. So too were their charges for drinking from the water fountains or stopping to marvel at the mountains. And we wandered down ostentatious and spacious streets and found we'd meet with folk tired and thin, walking hurried, checking their devices, greeting each other with declarations of stock prices. Then past piles of shells and little else, and even the dirt and ants had been valued with little price tags. And we found a great conch shell. A man waited outside so thin I wondered if he might already have died. My companion said, Sir Mayor, hello. The mayor replied, yes, have you come about my stock portfolio? Uh, no. This is my friend from beneath the sea, and if you've a moment, he has some questions for thee. Yes, I said. I'd like to know of you, how does one live well, and how does one see far, and how does one- The mayor interrupted, and how many shells will you pay me to answer these? None, admittedly, I said, but you do look a little hungry, and if you like, you can have this banana for free. He snatched it from me at once and said, Ah, I see. This will revolutionize the economy. I said, they literally grow on trees for free. But he was already off on some tirade about the banana trade. He yelled, why, by this time next week, I'll be a banana coin billionaire. My companion led me away, said, perhaps that's enough economics for today. And we fled the commotion past the starving rich masses to our balloon back over the ocean. My companion said, when the ones, twos, and threes are bored of their parties, they move for a while to the aisles of the fours, fives, and sixes to pursue a game of riches. I said, but they're all starving themselves. Yes, he said, but look at all their pretty shells. Hey, don't worry yourself. By the time they reach their seventh century, it becomes pretty evidentiary there's more to the world than just wealth. Said I, but what's the point in all this? Undying populations on little island nations, hosting parties, heeding the market's call, while above, each day, the moon sidles closer to come crashing down and ending it all. Why, my companion said, though it's easy to miss, 
there is a point to all this. The ones, twos and threes, they party nightly, yes, but by day they mine the metal and fell the trees we need for new technologies, for spaceship walls and ceiling beams and exotic matter machines. Then the fours, fives and sixes, why, they don't just pursue riches. By evening they take the felled trees and ore and ensure via the great space tether that it is all ascended into orbit, then assembled together into one great metal vessel. It is the most ambitious thing ever built from man's imagining. And not a few weeks from now, 10 million of us will empty our drawers and lock our doors and kiss goodbye the mountains and valleys and climb to that waiting galley. And once boarded, each find ourselves afforded four poster cryogenic beds, there to lay our heads for decades yet. And then in liquid nitrogen 10 liters deep, 10 million souls in no dream sleep. And each space aboard that isn't there to accommodate our frozen beds will carry instead what's left of the past. Each species will ride with us, from cabbage tree to New Zealand cowrie, every evergreen and deciduous, cedar to cork to eucalyptus, every genus and venus flytrap kept maintained by clockwork brains. And what's more, pig, donkey, boar, fly, swan, crustacean, dalmatian, domestic or wild, we've every gene on petri filed. Help, Neanderthals and early man too. And we fly out beyond the broken moon, a hard left past Jupiter, we wish him goodbye. Passing straight through the Oort cloud, turning about to enjoy the view, then setting sail on physics not so much in numbers indenture, but stolen from one of God's more surreal magic mushroom adventures. Contracting space before our noses, expanding it beyond our asses, will show time and Einstein a thing or two, until we fly faster than Zeno's racing tortoise, or poor swift Achilles who trailed then after. And roused again, we'll find we have arrived on the doorstep of a new house. Gravity that of Earth, and with an Earth's worth already of forests and seas and lakes and trees, and in the midday sky we'll find not one sun as we had before, but two in circumbinary ore. And though we'll bring food and clothes and build schools and roads, and paint our mark on every damn inch of the thing so it shines as one great living pearl among 10,000 dead worlds, not a gram of our stupid past will smuggle itself down onto the ground. No denial of what is in favour of what one wishes, no slinking off to watch TV and leaving some other poor bar to do the dishes. Science, truth, art, objectivity, universal human regard. Then finally the death of war and ignorance, and that infernal library of excuses for I, me, my, while you still lie in the gutter, and starve and die. We will build a world untainted by selfish bastards, where we'll be free-range humans at last, and do whatever we fucking like all day, and lay great brilliant eggs of knowledge and wisdom, and live under two suns at the expense of no one, finally out under the above, for love, for love. That is the Ninth Isle, and we set off in not a week's while, for our species try of one last pardon. We are going alone together, back to the garden. Ah, said me, sounds swell. And what about those of us in the nursery? Do we get to come as well? That's complicated, he said. We approached at last over a new aisle of yet another style. My companion said to me, why, it seems you and I are at the end of our journey. The Isle of the Eights. For almost a century, that has been the land upon where I lay my hat. Over we passed, I peeked in through the glass of the windows all wide and saw books stacked as towers and folk reading inside. What do they do? I said. They and you. Said he, I told you of the soon trip to our new home, and though we have solved much of the perils of travels in space, there is but one more problem we faced. On our journey, we want to take with us every film and thesis, every book and treatise, the mulch of every culture. But not even the moon would have enough room to store those works physically. And digitally, if we were to store it that way, cosmic rays would soon wipe it right out in but a few hundred days mid-flight. And so we found a method yet safer. Human brains. Each seven and eight, like me, commits to their memory some chosen book or speech to preserve until we reach the new house. We learn to remember to not forget. I said, and which work lives in your head? Said he, prose and poetry, 18th to 23rd century. For like you, I once had a grandfather who showed me the world in a manner I could understand. Back when the old world was still new, and so was I. I'd sit on his knee and he'd read to me long into the evening of fiction and farce, or whatever I asked, and for all those stories absurd, they gave me a passion for the percussion of words. And that's how I knew what it was I'd remember. 
I said, and your grandfather now, is he yet still alive? But our basket set down then. At last, we'd arrived. We disembarked single file on another new beach on another new isle. Nay, I said, wait, I remember this land. I, he said, is the same from the one we began. And then standing not feet from our great steed balloon was a woman there staring at the dead fractured moon. The woman called out, why, what a fair moon this evening. Aged so, it still exudes a vital glow. She turned on me, said, though true, the same cannot be said for you. Well, no, I said, since I am not aged so. My companion bowed his head, said nothing. Oh ye, she said, what the centuries have done to your memory. I replied, you must be mistaken, I am from the nursery. Said she, there is nursing there, certainly, but for those so aged, they cannot nurse themselves. I am the matron of the nursing dome, and I am here to take you home. By choice, will you come back with me, or need I summon armed security? Now look, I said, I am twenty or twenty-one rather, and I have come to find my grandfather, so why, she said, yet you walk hunched and move slow, such would we expect of one born a millennium ago. What? said I, and raised a hand to my eyes, and found the skin was cracked and cold, or one might venture, old. She said, how to put it well? Oh yes. Your generation is the reason the fall fell. All greed and in need of speed, and while patting yourselves on the back for progress, meanwhile leaving every garden unweeded, and all who fell behind unfed, then dead. You have been honorably discharged of being dishonorably in charge. And while we aren't as cruel as to have you all put down, we sure shan't opt for having you around. And so you are most welcome to the ocean floor, where you shan't ruin the world yet more. Yea, beneath the sea there are jigsaw puzzles and rocking chairs that wait again for thee. Next time we'll be sure to lock the doors. I am taking you back to the seabed once more. To the matron, my companion said, Why, I'm sorry I took him on a tour of the land. I only hoped he'd remember or at least understand. But before you bring him home, might for five minutes you leave us alone. Rose a skeptical eyebrow on her skeptical face, though she nodded and plodded off some while away. Oh gods, I cried, and closed my eyes. To my companion, I said, this is the dementia you mentioned. Yes, he said. I thought maybe with an hour or two it would come back to you, and you'd return to the nursing dome on your own. It's time for you to go home. If there's anything I can do for you. Yes, you can, said I. Let me lie here for the rest of my days, above the water in some semblance of a dignified way. I'm sorry, I'm so sorry, he said. I wish you luck in all hence. I said, don't apologize, there's no taken offense. Why, in a day or two, I suppose I'll remember neither the beach nor you. Thank you for my big day out. We hugged then in the awkward male fashion, two loose grips and a little back tapping. He turned about, bound inland, bound starward. No great elation, no great despair. I simply gulped the salt sea air and wondered then if I would ever breathe it again. My companion paused and turned about, let out. They gave me an early warning, the nursing dome, I mean, when you made your great escape. Gave me time to reach the beach and wait in hope you'd rise alive from the waters. And so you did, and so I found you. Early warning why, I said. What are you to me or I to thee? He said, my grandfather was never the sort to go quietly once caught. Said I, that may be, and yet your grandfather is not me. Said he, but you are. Have you been so by time defiled you don't recall your own grandchild? It was I who sent the letter, hoping for the better you'd recall who I was, and though you remembered me fine, you mixed me up in time. I did not want to leave you down here without one last try at goodbye. I didn't know for my sake you'd stage a fucking prison break. I only meant to say goodbye. Well, I said. Then, hello. Oh God, I remember between the fields and owls and shrike, long hours teaching you how to ride a bike. Yes, he said. Yes, said me. I remember ye upon my knee and from the elm tree sat ten starlings deep and I'd read you till you fell asleep. Yes, he said. And the alphabet and cigarettes and ethernet and tape cassettes. It was the old world and I think of it every day and I think of you on the seabed every day. And because ruin the world or not, you are my grandfather and I am your blood. And while you may not remember those kindnesses you did me when I was little, I do and I will remember for both of us. And if one day I have children, I will tell them of you. 
you, so that even when I am gone, your kindnesses will thread on down the hooks of your descendants, and then your kindnesses will never die. And when both of us are gone, when we're only stories, it will still live on, until there and all of time and space snuff to dust, and dust enough, there will be two facts lying left over in dead eternity. That you were my grandfather, and I loved you. And I cannot spend another week worrying that alone and decrepit beneath the sea sits you, while I waltz off to Xanadu, even if I make it to the edge of space. Over the threshold will still be there your old, sad face. I said, yet all the while you are still bound for the Ninth Isle, and I for jigsaws and sliding doors. I just hope you recall me in good stead. He replied, then you may wish of me the same tomorrow, for I am staying right beside your empty head. And I protested, but you set off for the stars in not a week, you said. Rockets be damned, said my grandson. One day they'll build another, it's what humans do. But grandfathers are a one-time construction, and these may be my last days with you. Let's run back to the old world. Let's find the tree ten starlings deep, and I'll read you till you fall asleep. And if little pieces of yesterday come back to you whenever, then tell me, and we'll remember them together. And back down the beach, back to the balloon. We were off on the wind then and under the moon, at last, borne back ceaselessly into the past. And from our basket, Sebastian yelled with all his might, Hey matron, go fuck yourself. Big kiss. Good night. The new world pulled away behind, and on some perfect fever dream's frontier, the old world drew near. Something waited, and though dead for sure, it waited to receive us once more. And my grandson began to shout the poems we'd known from the tomes we'd owned, and the lines came back easily even to me. We remembered. We remembered together. Let us go then, you and I, he yelled. When the evening is spread out against the sky, I replied, like a patient etherized upon a table. Let us go through certain half-deserted streets, the muttering retreats of restless nights in one-night cheap hotels, and sawdust restaurants with oyster shells. About, about, in reel and rout, the death fires danced at night. The water, like a witch's oils, burnt green and blue and white. And some in dreams assured were of the spirit that plagued us so. Nine fathom deep, he had followed us from the land of mist and snow. In Xanadu, did Kubla Khan a stately pleasure dome decree Where Alf the sacred river ran Through caverns measureless to man Down to a sunless sea So twice five miles of fertile ground With walls and towers were girdled round And there were gardens bright with sinuous rills Where blossomed many an incense-bearing tree And here were forests ancient as the